All right. Can you all see the slides? Yes, looks good. All right, great. So uh, thank you for the introduction once again, and thank you all for joining me on this talk, despite this wordy mouthful of a title, which I realized in hindsight. So with that said, I would like to transition to this slide, which is a much simpler, simpler title, which is Simplifying Complex Next Generation Sequencing or NGS Analysis. And for the, for the remainder of the, of the talk, I'd just like you to keep this in mind, how we can create simple, easy to use tools. So uh, with that said, I'd just like to go over what a typical NGS workflow looks like. So let's say that you want to analyze one, one particular sample uh, to see the gene expression in, in uh, let me just make sure I can get my pointer here. Okay, so let's say you want to look at a particular sample, let's say a tumor sample, and you want to see what genes are being expressed. So you'd isolate that tumor, you'd extract the, the, the RNA, and then you'd fragment that and process it by adding different adapters, and then you'd sequence it, typically on an Illumina sequencing platform. And what that leaves you with is some raw read files, which are called fast key files. And these are essentially specialized text files, which contains information about what transcripts or which genes were identified in your sample. And then using these read files, you have to align it or map it to a reference genome. So if we're looking at a human sample, we would align it to the human genome, obviously. And then this would give us a table of read counts. And this is basically a, uh, a table with genes along, along in the rows and then each of your samples would be in columns and there would be uh, numbers which identify how many times that transcript was identified or uh, detected in that particular sample. And then after that, you do some differential or DE analysis or uh, some type of abundance analysis to, uh, especially if you're comparing across multiple samples to see how those read counts change from one sample to the next. And then this will give you the uh, differential gene expression or DGE or some type of other features of interest which will inform you on what to do next, such as what other genes or pathways to investigate, which genes or pathways to target with particular drugs. So this entire process can be very complex. Of course, here it seems simple for you know, the one I'm depicting one sample, but this can be quite complex. Real world experiments are not as typically not as simple as this, especially when you're trying to find something groundbreaking and exciting, right? And each of these steps here can be pretty time consuming too. So let's consider one of these real world situations. So let's say you have three cancer patients and let's say you wanna see how a particular tumor, it doesn't really matter what type of tumor or what type of cancer, but let's say you wanna see how these particular tumors in these patients respond to a particular drug. So let's say through biopsies, these tumors were obtained. And then let's consider this first one over here. So we take that and we graft it into two groups, uh, two cohorts of mice. Uh, there's a control group which receives saline, and then there's a drug treater group which receives your drug of interest. And these are, by the way, these are immunocompromised mice that can take up, a, a, accept a, a human tumor graft or human cell graft. So in each of these cohorts, there are triplicates or three mice. So we graft uh, pieces of that tumor into these mice, and then we treat this, uh, each group for six weeks. And at the end of that six weeks, we excise the tumors and we prepare them for, um, for sequencing. And in this particular case, we're doing single cell RNA sequencing. So we also add some synthetic uh, nucleotides to keep track of which sample and which replicate and which, which treatment group that each of these excised tumors come from. So we add those and we, we prepare it and we process it. And we... Uh, 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 get it ready basically for sequencing. And this, so this is what we do for one tumor. And then for this other tumor, we do the same thing. And then also for this one here, which is grayed out just to make this figure um, easy, easy to read. So here's a full look at that uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the protocol. So once you process everything for sequencing and you do the actual sequencing, you know, you do some analysis magic and you end up with these really cool uh, looking figures that we typically get for single cell sequencing uh, projects, which are these uh, uh, cluster plots showing how different cells 
or different samples cluster in, in TSLI or UMAP blocks. But before, before we get there, consider how much data that's actually here. So we have three patients. From each patient, we have two treatment groups. From each treatment group, there are three replicates, which contain some uh, synthetic or, or um, artificial nucleotide barcodes, which, which are also sequenced. And then from each tumor, so from each of these tumors here, uh, the, uh, the, the, the leftover tumors that we're going to uh, sequence after the drug treatment, we're going to roughly detect 5 million cells per replicate. And then because it's a single cell RNA sequencing, from each of those 5 million cells, we're going to detect roughly 20,000 protein coding genes, which is roughly the number of protein coding genes that are present in the human genome. So that, that's a ton of data. So how do we go from all of that data that the sheer size, you know, consider not just the values that are, that are required, the, the numerical values, but the actual size on, on disk. How do we go from there to the final nice looking publication quality figures? So there are multiple ways to analyze these types of experiments. And you don't really need to know, I'm not gonna go over each of these different components. We, you can read these steps if you like, and I've kind of put the logos of, of the common ones here on, on the side. But the takeaway is that there's really no, um, there's really no uh, best way to do this. There's multiple, in each of these steps, you can swap out different components and you can run the pipeline different ways. So more or less, you're gonna get the same answer, which means that if a gene is really overexpressed or underexpressed in a tumor, you're gonna, and if it's statistically significant and if, if it's actually occurring, you're going to find it despite which which tool or which method you use. But the point here is that all of these methods are command line based or scripting based, which means that a typical wet lab scientist who's carrying out this experiment is probably not well versed in how to analyze this data. Uh, so that that's a huge uh, a roadblock for them to analyze their own data. The other thing to consider is that like I said, at each of these different steps, you can use different uh, tools to analyze the data. Now, when you when you have a pipeline, uh, the output coming from one of those uh, tools can't necessarily right away be fed into the next successive, successive component. You'd have to do some modifications or some pre-processing to make sure that the next component can actually meaningfully make sense of that data. If you're not careful, if you put something in that's not compatible, it may run and you're going to get a skewed or a statistically uh, non-meaningful or incorrect output, uh, which can really affect your downstream uh, analyses. So that creates some uh, difficulties and barriers that are encountered in NGS pipeline. So not just for single cell sequencing, but for uh, other types of sequencing too, whether it's CRISPR screening, ATAC-seq, CHIP-seq, whole genome-seq. So when you're when you're analyzing all these different experiments, the complexity of the amount of samples or the amount of replicates or the type of experiment that you're doing is going to uh, affect how you analyze it. And not every experiment is unique. You could do two. We could, we could take the experiment that the uh, the single cell sequencing experiment that I showed, and you can do it for the same type of cancer from different patients, and it still it may not always be. Uh, the same process in terms of analyzing it. You may encounter some issues with the samples. You may encounter some issues with the replicates, uh, some sequencing errors. So you need to be able to uh, adapt uh, and, and, and be dynamic and not rigid in the way you analyze these. The other thing is, like I said, there's multiple tools and multiple languages and platforms. So you may do your, the, the alignments are typically done in bash uh, or, or, or shell scripting. Um, you could use R or Python for some of the differential uh, expression analysis. Sometimes some steps are uh, run using tools designed in Perl or C. So uh, you need to know, uh, you know, the app, the, as bioinformaticians, if you're a bioinformatician, you know that there's multiple tools that you have to use. And then also the compute resources involved. So these are things like CPU, uh, RAM, and disk space, and the, the larger uh, or more samples and replicates that your experiment has, uh, the more of these resources that you will require. So sometimes these things can't really be run on a local machine. Uh, 
And obviously each of these things contributes to time, whether it's the time used to learn how to run the pipeline or just the sheer amount of time required to run some of the steps. So how do you solve for this? So obviously you can automate the pipelines, but just crudely automating scripts isn't necessarily uh, going to work that well. It's still, that still creates some rigidity, like I said, and you need to be able to be flexible for uh, the uniqueness of different experiments. So you can provide a modular framework then. So this modular framework basically means that different modules can be shuffled in and out depending on the experiment, depending, depending on the uh, issues encountered during the analysis. And then you can abstract away the languages and tools from the user. So you can have one overarching programming language like Python or R that then calls all the other languages and tools that are required. So in this way, you remove the user from what languages are being used for the analysis, and all of that is handled in the background. And then for the compute resources, you can make your tool cloud-based, so using something like AWS. So this makes it really easy for the user because they don't have to worry about the number of uh, uh, CPU cores they have, the amount of disk space they have, or the amount of RAM they have. Everything is done on the cloud, so they can virtually run it on, on uh, uh, any type of local machine. And then using parallel processing, we can really speed up the amount of time that's, that, it, that it takes to um, analyze these types of complex experiments. So we're building a solution that is a, a point and click solution. So it's a graphical user interface uh, tool to analyze experiments, uh, uh, a multitude of NGS experiments. And we're beginning with single cell sequencing experiments. So, it's a point and click interface and the react the the, uh, the front end is built using react so the user can point and click upload their data their raw read files that comes out of the the, the sequencing platform they can customize all of the parameters of the experiment um, uh, things like the, the type of experiment how many samples they have the replicates any cutoff thresholds any statistical parameters and anytime there's uh, several options to do a particular step, such as clustering or normalization. All of these can be customized using just you know, selecting from a list in pure English. They don't need to know um, uh, uh, the, 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 the command line arguments to, to define those parameters. And then once that's done, based on the parameters, an automated framework is assembled, and this runs the actual uh, analysis and so this this is really the meat of the tool if you will so uh, our framework is built in in so we use python as the overarching language and then using um uh, things like reticulate and uh, basilisk we can uh, there's interoperability with r uh, and so they work they work together and then we also respect the bioconductor framework. So we follow the bioconductor principles for analyzing and working with genomic data, so different types of uh, uh, genomic data objects. And then the back end is handled via Flask. This is what uh, uh, allows us to uh, quickly and efficiently shuffle the data uh, from the uh, back end analysis into, into the front end. And then, of course, for the cloud, we use things like EC2 for the instances, EFS and S3 for the data storage, and ECS for, for the uh, uh, containerization uh, of different modules. And you, so you, know, you can see all the technologies we're using. Okay, so what does this actually look like, though? Um, you know, this, it's, it's easy to put this in words, but what does it actually look like when we create it? And this is when you see how complex it can really be. So here's still yet a, a, a more detailed, but still a simplified um, flowchart of how the platform works. So we have our the, the automated framework that's put together after the user defines all the, all the parameters. And then we have, uh, we, we use an S3 bucket where the raw read files uh, from the user are deposited. And then the EC2 instance is spun up depending on uh, the size and parameters that the user defines. And then this in parallel does the read alignments. So for a single cell sequencing experiment, this is looking at the unique molecular identifiers from each sample and uh, replicates and looking at the read counts per gene uh, at, at each individual cell level. And at the same time, there's some demultiplexing happening to uh, identify uh, which 
uh, replicates and control groups each of those cells belong to. So for example, the saline group or the drug treated group, group, and is it from which mouse is it from, mouse one, two, three, and also which patient is it from, patient one, two, three. So all of that data is obtained. And then some quality control is performed automatically, and that's saved in an intermediate um, uh, data storage bucket. And then with all of these read counts, these are integrated and unified into a Surat object in R. And this prepares it for uh, single cell sequencing analysis. And then here, in a modular approach, normalization is performed, some type of filtering is performed, variable features are identified, and different types of clustering can be done. And this is also done on an easy to interface. Uh, and then the results are then uh, uh, stored in, a, in, a, in an R uh, object and then saved into a final results data bucket in S3. And then there's an interactive visualization component, which is also uh, run via e, uh, EC2 automatically. And here the user can explore the data in real time and customize their outputs uh, and generate uh, uh, high quality publication ready figures. So to give you an idea of the different technologies being used here, it's just uh, the uh, 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 logos of each technology. So as I said, the uh, uh, overarching tool is built using uh, Python, a Python backend. Uh, and then that Python uh, code calls different modules, which itself can be Python or R. And uh, in some cases, like here for normal, normalizing, filtering, and clustering, we can use either R or Python. So it depends on uh, which is more uh, uh, performant for the type of data and also which, which uh, uh, types of methods or statistical methods the user wants to run. Um, and then also um, the, the final interactive platform is a mix of Python, R, Python, React, and Flask. So this is a it's a it's a work in progress. This uh, this solution. Our goal is to create uh, uh, follow this this framework for this point and click analysis tool for a multitude of uh, NGS uh, experiments. So we're starting with single cell sequencing, but this is something that can be expanded to other things like ATAC seq, chip seq, whole genome seq, and CRISPR screening, and also integrating different modalities together. So. The modular framework allows the integration of these different things, such as single cell sequencing and CRISPR screening, for example. Um, so, in the interest of time here, I'm just going to summarize. Um, so, uh, in summary, so I, sh I showed you just a, a, a very high level look at a point and click analysis solution that we're building, which leverages different uh, web based technologies uh, to make it really abstract the user away from all the uh, complexities of analyzing it, of analyzing the data. And by using a modular approach, this is scalable across different experiments. So it can be tweaked to run, uh, to analyze very unique experiments. And inherently then it makes reproducibility, reproducibility really easy because um, uh, that framework can be saved as a log file and you can easily go back and, and reproduce the data that's run, that's, that was run later on. And it increases efficiency and it's scalable for many uh, forever growing uh, uh, sizes of NGS experiments and the full pipeline is automated. And this really reduces barriers to entry for NGS analysis. And uh, it, it just opens the door for many people to, to analyze their own data, uh, uh, even if it's just a cursory look before they do some uh, detailed analysis with, uh, with um, seasoned bioinformaticians. So, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, our, our team, which is basically myself and Megan who are working on this project. So Megan, Megan Chang is a R and Python developer by name, but I like to consider her as a multi-technology extraordinaire because I can give her seemingly impossible tasks and she comes back with amazing results. And if, if it wasn't for her, this project would still just be a, an idea on a, uh, on a, on a whiteboard somewhere. Uh, so with that, I will try to stop the presentation so I can see the window again. Thank you so there. much, Piro. Uh, I think we have uh, we have about two minutes for questions. Uh, I don't see any new questions in the Q and A, so I'm gonna kick it off. So, um, so I, I think I think this uh, uh, you know. Um, 
lowering the barrier of entry to doing NGS analysis is a com completely um, uh, painful gap in uh, NGS analysis and omics analysis in general. Um, uh, and uh, really, I think delays a lot of research that, that for uh, unnecessarily because uh, because you have to hand things off to uh, to your bioinformatics team and then they'll they might they might um, it, it, and really you can't do it yourself uh, or at least it's very difficult. So I think this is very welcome. What I'm wondering though is that uh, is 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 about reproducibility and whether uh, you know having a point and click kind of interface is the right way to do this if you want to have a reproducible workflow. So my question is, do you think there should be an a, sort of an opinionated tidyverse inspired modular grammar for omics analysis? And I'm thinking about something along the lines of tidy models where you have where it's modular, it wraps a ton of different existing functionality in a consistent API. And uh, it seems like the process would be amenable to pipes, right? <laughs> and it would be great to have outputs like tidy tibbles that to easily work with uh, ggplot, gg summary, dplyr. Um, so I'm wondering if, if that's something that you think should be done, whether that's another way that you could think about this or you know, whether the, your thoughts on uh, having a tidy grammar uh, for this so you can do this stuff that point and clicky stuff programmatically. Yeah, that's a, that's a great that's a great question, and I, I think that is that that is something that you need to be cognizant of when developing these kinds of tools. So I think there's uh, several ways to tackle that, and uh, yeah, having a like uh, um, tiny models is great. Tiny models is a great example. So I think you know if we had let's say something called tiny genomics mm -hmm. for like you know on the spot thinking, I think something like that that defines how these different data objects are processed and, and defines mm -hmm. different methods and acts as an API, like you said, will make it really scalable for uh, all the new types of NGS modalities that are coming out. And as sequencing gets cheaper, it, there's, it, it's gonna encourage more people to you know, incorporate larger and larger uh, samples and replicates and integrate uh, many different modalities. So uh, I think something like that will be important. Um, the way we're handling it is kind of a, a different approach, like kind of having a controlled uh, containers that specify. So we're using bioconductor framework. So we're having for the reproducibility aspect that you touched on, we're having oh, we're working with uh, Docker containers that have locked uh, mm -hmm. uh, versions of the different uh, R packages uh, or Python packages. Uh, so uh, based on the log file that's created when you run the tool. And if you go back to it, and if you load that log file, it'll spin up the, the correct container to make it reproducible. Um, because you know th 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 these kinds of tools are something. So as a as a biochemist and bioinformatician, mm -hmm. these kind of point and click tools are something I've been working on for a while. And yeah, you can have packages update, and it can really break everything. And yeah. it's not so reproducible then. So yeah, that's something really important you have to consider.